wow, this is a, a room full of people, isn't it? So a very, very long time since I stood in front of this number of people and talked. I would just say to Mr. Paul, my heart is going 100 miles an hour. It's probably all the caffeine I've had today to try and keep myself away from it. Um, thank you very much for coming on this evening. Um, you're obviously here to hear all about the kind of like the, the backdrop of the, of the ski trip. So I'm going to give you lots and lots of information which it's all at your fingertips, so the booklet is going to kind of like follow through the presentation. Um, the COVID rules and expectations and procedures information sheet is going to kind of like give a good summary of all of the COVID information we're going to tell you about. Um, hopefully by the end of it, you'll be totally informed and won't be having to answer lots and lots of emails with respect to all of the kind of the, the things associated with the ski trip that's going to turn off. It's almost like I've got thunder in the background, isn't it? Ah, ah, ah. Let's try again. Thunder. That's the sound of somebody calming it down in peace. I mean, I was, uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, go on an inspection visit in February to, to kind of like check things out. It was, uh, it was a really unpleasant experience. We can ski in Austria, um, and, and the resort was was in immaculate condition because nobody's been skiing for for many many months. And of course, because it was an inspection visit, there were no school trips there, so there was no gun piece, and I got the opportunity to spend a lovely weekend with one of my colleagues, just checking out what your children are going to kind of experience in the near future. So, um, so why is this trip important? I suppose that's something that we really need to address, isn't it? Why is it important? Well, it's invaluable life skills. Now, I've just taken my two children skiing at February half term, one's six and one's three, because I hope that in the future that they will want to go on and enjoy skiing, because it's fun and enjoyable. You, you get an opportunity to go and spend some time in another country, so it's culturally enhancing. Of course, when you send your, your loved ones off to, to spend the time with me, um, they will be independent because they won't be wanting to spend any time with the teachers and they will be wanting to spend time with each other. Resilience, they're going to need lots and lots of resilience on this ski trip. Social skills, I'm hoping to try and surprise them away from the screens to be able to uh, kind of like engage with their peers and interact with each other. Lifelong memories and certainly enhance, enhance their self-esteem. Um, I, mean, I don't know if any of you are fortunate enough to go on a school ski trip. I went on a ski trip when I was in year nine and I can remember everything about it 30 odd years after the fact. And um, I can't remember what I did in the maths lesson or the English lessons or the geography lessons, but I can remember my ski trip. And fingers crossed, those kind of memories that your children will have having had this experience. But, you know, even though the the staff who are taking the trip, joking aside, that you know we do get a chance to spend time on the slopes. It is very much far from a relaxing holiday for us. Yes, we do get to spend a little bit of time skiing, but you know I need to make sure that you're fully aware that we have been working very hard and will continue to work very hard. Uh, one to get the trip up and running, but two when we get there to look after your children. And they volunteered. Uh, to come on the trip um, and I need to thank them personally for putting their foot forward um, for providing your children with their, this amazing opportunity. So this is the, the staff list and I don't know if the children know who's coming on the trip um, but obviously it's myself, I'm Mr Boothman, um, Miss Wright uh, is going to be my deputy leader so I'll be in charge of one coach and Mrs Wright's going to be in charge of the other coach. Then we have Mr Wright uh, who's here this evening, Miss Lancel, who's here this evening, Miss Richards, Miss Gray, Miss Jackson, uh, Mr Sloan, who's also here this evening, 
Mr Atkinson again, who's here, and also Mr Potter. So we're going to be taking your children away. So it's a very, very lengthy document, is this? And I feel the need to talk through it because at about half past 11 last night, when I was still trying to summarise the, the COVID situation for you on, on to two sides of A4, um, paraphrasing, rewriting, to, to try and make it as easy as possible for you to understand. Um, I suppose in that respect, I probably need to kind of read through what he says. So it says, read through the information carefully with respect to entry to France and Austria, the procedures that we'll be asking you to go through prior to completing the trip. It is complicated, um, but hopefully this document will kind of like ease all of your worries and concerns, tell you exactly what you need to do, and therefore you won't need to kind of like ask me any more questions with respect to does it matter if they've only got one vaccine or uh, they're going to have a vaccine in this time that they need to, to be able to have two vaccines by the time so, so um, as a consequence of this, uh, hopefully we're all clear. So as it stands now on the 17th, the 17th, 17th of, of March, um, the rules for France and Austria are different. So this is what's complicating things. Because uh, Austria regards that one vaccine and one recovery from COVID and or two vaccines is fully vaccinated, whereas France doesn't. To be fully vaccinated for France, you need to have had two COVID um, vaccinations. <coughs> Therefore, because we are travelling through France, we have to regard anybody that's not double vaccinated as um, uh, unvaccinated. Now, you might think, well, hang on, sir, but Austria does allow you to be unvaccinated, sorry, sorry, allows you to have one vaccine to be recovered. In terms of the logistics inside of things, for the, the testing that we're going to have to go through, that's the reason why. So, in consultation with, with IBT, uh, we've been advised that carrying out PCR tests for those students that are not fully vaccinated, so that <coughs> is anybody on the trip who has not received two vaccines, um, is the least problematic with respect to obtaining results. Um, whilst it's possible in theory to use an LFT test, uh, we feel that the logistics behind this of asking you as parents and the children to be responsible for taking photographs of tests, uploading them onto the portal, then somebody um, who will look at that um, photograph will then decide whether your child's got COVID or not, and then we'll then send that back to the child's phone. Um, and because sometimes you can um, just do a 24 hour test, depending on whether it's France or Austria, sometimes it's 48 hours, we just need to bypass all of that. Um, so what we're going to ask is that anybody that's, as I say, not double vaccinated to carry out a PCR test. Um, this will be done on Thursday the 7th of April after school. So on consultation with IBT, they're going to get the test to school for about half past three. Now what I haven't included on this uh, document is the procedure that we as staff are going to have to go through to ensure that the students fulfill this. And this is um, obviously something that we will oversee. I've looked at the, the, the list that, of the information that you sent in to me prior to, to this evening, which I collected maybe a couple of months ago. And I think at that time we had maybe 40 students that were not double vaccinated. I'm sure now, when we ask the same question, the, the number will have obviously got a lot lower. So it might be that this information is kind of like relevant to 10, 15 students. But I'll obviously talk through everything with you. So, what happens is the, the company will then take all of the um, PCR tests away to the PCR centre where they look at the results and then they will email all of the results back to me. It won't go to the children, it will come through to me, so I will have all of those results. I'll then be able to say, yes, we've not got a case of COVID, uh, absolutely fine, you can come on the trip. I don't want to be kind of like asking students to test on Saturday morning and then arriving at school when we depart, still not having had that test result, um, getting on the coach, 
and then getting halfway down the A1 and then all of a sudden that result comes in to a student and they turn around and say, yeah, unfortunately we, are, we have tested positive or it's inconclusive. Now you've, you've paid £70 for, for the testing, which was to cover um, a PCR test and an LFT test. Um, everybody that's double vaccinated, all of that money will obviously go back to you. Um, anybody that does need to be vaccinated, um, the LFT test is slightly cheaper, it's a lot cheaper than a PCR test. So what the school has decided to do is to help you out, is to subsidise the cost of the PCR test. So everybody will get £40 back of the £70, so we're only going to keep the £30, the test is £60. Um, and you will get that, that back and that will ensure that everybody receives the PCR test, the results come to me and then we don't have logistical issues with respect to the trip. Um, go down, it says providing evidence of the student's vaccination status. Um, so I request that all parents email to me a PDF of their child's COVID <coughs> status or an NHS letter, which can be obtained from the NHS website, and that's by Tuesday the 29th of March. The reason it needs to be that Tuesday is because IBT need me to place the order for the PCR tests on the 30th. So that is the kind of the cut-off point. I have said um, that's irrespective of whether they are fully <coughs> vaccinated or not, because I still want to have everybody's COVID status with me. Um, I will then have the necessary COVID status of all passengers on the trip and you can send this to my email address. Um, and I've, I've typed it correct this time, apologies about the last time I sent that one out yeah, because still, that didn't happen, did it? So, on receipt of the evidence, I'll be able to update my COVID status spreadsheet, order the necessary PCR test from IBT and generate a, re a refund from Inversa. Appreciate that maybe some students receiving a COVID vaccination after this date. So you might be sat there thinking, well, Mr. Boomin, we've got our COVID vaccination on the 2nd of April. If that is the case, then uh, communicate to me, email, phone me up, and then we'll just talk about those individual cases, case by case, to see what the best course of action is. Um, now, uh, obviously, we with the NHS app and NHS letters. So this is why, kind of looking through the, the finer detail last night, um, it, it's come, become apparent to me that, that actually to download the NHS app, if you don't know your NHS number, um, you have to upload a photograph of your own passport. And what you then do is then turn on your camera and then the camera and then turn around the screen so it faces you and you have to say four numbers and then what it does is it cross-references your face with your passport and then it allows you to down, download the NHS app. Therefore, I've asked you to hand all of your passports in tonight where if you haven't downloaded the NHS app uh, onto your child's phone, because it needs to be on your child's phone, then you may need to hold on to your passport to be able to do this. Now, I've put links onto the, the letter. There's a, a YouTube video of what to do about uploading the NHS app. Um, I've also put on there a, a link to how you access the, the NHS um, website to upload the, the letter. Now, if you have already got the NHS app on your child's phone, and you're able to access their COVID status, at the end of the evening, by all means, you're able to hand in your passports because Clearly, you, you've already done that, but I just wanted to make you aware of that. That will just mean that I'll just have to collect the passports in at a later time. I think it takes about two hours for the confirmation of the NHS app to open on your phones. Um, so it might be that in a couple of days' time, you could then return your passports and things into me. The last thing about COVID um, that we really need to, to ensure that students have is face coverings. And that was kind of like um, something that you just had to get used to. Um, Austria has, has a strict rule with respect to face coverings needing to be FFP2 standard, which is slightly more kind of robust and covers slightly more of your face with, uh, than the, the ones that we've been using in this country, certainly the ones that are um, obviously um, 
fabric ones that you kind of like you could buy for yourself to save them on the environment. Um, it may be that we are challenged to use any public facilities and or transport, which includes all of the kind of the lift systems in the resort. So when we were out skiing in February, they were they were very strict. If you didn't have the face covering on to get on the, the outside gondola or the outside chair the, to go up the mountain, then you weren't allowed to get on the chair. Um, I kind of ended up just wearing it as a face mask to keep my chin warm for the rest of the rest of the weekend, which kind of like it was fine, and it was just part and parcel. And um, I put a link on there onto this letter to it's an Amazon link. I think a pack of twenty costs around six pounds. You would not need to take twenty. I think I managed to last um, the weekend just using the same one, so probably you might be able to pair up with somebody else, um, buy a pack of 20 between two people and then share 10 each. I'll obviously take some spares, um, but I won't be able to take enough for 76 students for, for a week, so I need you to, to buy them as part of your, your kit. Contrary to all of that, it might be that in a couple of days, a couple of weeks time, they might change the all of the rules and I'd have to redraft this letter and it might change but as it stands this is where we're at and of course any any changes to that I will be very quick to, to pass all that information on to you. Um, apologies that I've obviously had to talk through that which um, obviously um, is kind of like important. So um, the other question is what happens uh, when we're in result? Well, uh, students will be required to demonstrate their COVID status whilst on the trip. These checks could occur at any time, including when in shops, restaurants, and also to be using lifts. So, we, with this in mind, we need to create a COVID status card, which they will carry at all times. So, uh, this will mean that uh, they are not going to have a, to rely on their mobile phones to provide proof of vaccination and COVID status. Been a number of people who've kind of like emailed through, given me ideas and suggestions about how we kind of like accommodate that, and I really do appreciate any kind of like positive uh, help with respect to, to this. Um, what I'm going to do is, on receipt of all of the kind of the um, PDFs that you send in, I'm then going to create some lanyards for the students to wear, so they're not relying on their phones during the trip, and then they will have them. On themselves at all times at any point on the trip somebody comes to check what their COVID status is they will have the relevant kind of pass that will also include if they have to do a, P, a PCR test I'll laminate that so that will be with the students I'll just condense them down into a small sheet so that they're there and we'll just as, as staff make ensure that the students have them with them at all times when they're, they're out of the hotel um, COVID testing in resort, there's no requirement to do any COVID testing in resort. That's changed, that wasn't the case. Um, therefore, we don't want any students to come down with COVID. Um, we're not going to do, just be doing testing on a daily basis to check whether they've got the virus or not. The only time that we would test the students is if they did start to show signs of having COVID or starting to feel unwell and we suspected that it was COVID. Um, I'm gonna take COVID tests with me. Um, you don't need to carry any tests with you. Um, if you did test a student, they did test positive, then, then they would have to isolate in the hotel. Um, there's measures in place in the hotel to ensure that, that there would be a place for somebody to isolate. Not a very pleasant thing to have to do, um, to stay in a room by yourself. Um, after five days, the rules are uh, that you can start to test again. If you test negative after day five and day, and you do two consecutive days, then you would be able to effectively ski again if there was still any skiing time, or travel back with us. If you went past that time, then of course a member of Milford staff would be remaining with your, your child and staying in resort, and they would then be using the insurance, the COVID insurance, to, to book travel to come back to the country. Um, if we, we've kind of like stipulated that if there's more than one student, two students, we would always have two members of staff. And then 
obviously the ratios of the coaches and the staff on the trip needs to be kind of like reflect who's where. Um, there is also a possibility that the, the insurance company could potentially fly parents out to resort to act as their local apprentice to, to become as parents and then fly you back. And we would obviously communicate with you to see whether that was viable or not. Um, it wouldn't be a free ski holiday for you because you'd be stuck in a hotel, but it might be that that's what you would like to do. You know, your, your child might be a little bit distraught. You wanted to be there for them. It might be possible to fly you off. But if that wasn't the case, clearly we would stay in the resort and look after the children. Um, okay. Right. Um, what to bring? Packing for a trip. <laughs> what do you take? What's the weather going to be like? Well, you go into a mountain resort, but you can you can have minus two degrees in the morning in Easter, and it can be like 10, 12 degrees in the afternoon on a ski resort. Some days it can snow very heavily, other days it can be bright blue sunshine and you don't want to wear any ski clothing. So so it's the it's that question, isn't it? What to take? I've kind of like summarised it in a nutshell by saying I can only provide you with with certain details, and that's kind of like bag sizes, what you should put in your hand luggage, specialist clothing. Um, just need to be mindful that your, your children are going to be wearing ski clothing for the vast majority of the time. Um, well up into the late evening, we don't finish skiing until four, half four by the time we've put skis away and then got into the boot room and then got a little coach journey back to the hotel, five o'clock and then then we might be just straight into tea because we're a little bit late coming back to the hotel at six o'clock and then all of a sudden they go out to have a shower at seven o'clock and you know there's only a couple of hours where they're not going to be not wearing the ski clothing so just they don't need an extensive wardrobe um, it's fine for you to, to put on the same clothes you had on the day before that you've only worn for a couple of hours um, only lounge clothing for the, or the evening uh, only lounge clothing for the evenings, I've said. Um, it just needs to be not not a great deal, not not lots of different outfits. Um, and then, obviously, type this in there last night because it was just one of those kind of like light bulb moments. Don't forget to pack the European club adapter. Why that appears in my presentation at this point, I don't know. It doesn't really fit there, does it? Um, so suitcase. A suitcase, how big, how small, a suitcase. You know, some students will come with a suitcase that's up here, and others will come with one down there. You're going to pack your suitcase, aren't you? Um, and I'm not going to go, you can't bring that suitcase on. So we say medium, medium suitcase. Um, and that carries all of the specialist clothing, leisure clothes for the evenings. We can't access that during the trip, so it goes underneath the coach uh, hold all area. And then, one piece of hand luggage to carry with them onto the coach for the journey, which includes things like the, anything that's going to entertain them for the journey, food, drink, warm layers, maybe a blanket if they wanted to bring a blanket with them, a uh, travel pillow, and of course a wash bag because we're traveling through the night, we'd like to see some personal hygiene. Um, it might be worth wearing their ski jacket uh, rather than putting that on the hold up because that would be the warmest thing that they've probably got to carry that on the coach you know we, we're going to be driving through france and austria uh, in the middle of the night and it, it will it does get cold on the coach so just putting your big ski coat on is a good thing that might be instead of a blanket and or a blanket um, we just remember that whatever you bring in your hand luggage that's going to sit in front of you in the footwell now if you're massive then you don't want to be bringing something too big because that's going to eat into your space. If you're a tiny, weeny person, then obviously fill your boots, even bring a massive bag so you've got something to put your feet on. Uh, this is the kit list then. So uh, I did email this out. Um, this has got the specialist clothing. Um, Interski. I know many of you have kind of used Interski. Uh, I've got a box full of clothing that, that people have ordered through the list there. Well done to all the boys and girls who've been to collect that already. It might be that you've arrived to see Mr Potter and your bag wasn't there, maybe because the order that you've placed was a little bit after the first orders. 
rest assured he will be delivered. I think with I mean, with Interski being so busy, they're just trying to get rid of all of their ski clothing, sending it off in bits and bobs, um, and then it will arrive at school at some point. Um, I, think, I can't remember what the deadline has said was for ordering clothing. It's about now, really. So if you haven't ordered ski clothing from Interski, you, you wanted to, then that's something that you need to do. Um, everything is highlighted there. Everything's got an asterisk and extra. It's kind of like key. Everything else that's on there is kind of like kind of important but not essential. I'm not going to read through the list. We we do carry spare things. So I do carry spare spare packs and spare jackets and goggles and, and gloves because things get ripped or things get dropped or things get lost. Um, so that's obviously for us to worry about. Uh, so the next one's just about medication and on arriving on the, on the day that it's set up. So um, medication, many students require to bring with them some medication, sometimes um, tablets, um, liquids, uh, in inhalers, EpiPens, etc. We need to just make sure that students have the medicine that they need to have. You've already provided me with their medical information. Um, thank you for anybody that's sent an email in updating anything because I know that things change over time. If anything has changed subsequently since you sent that information, just email to me and I'll update my spreadsheet. But before departure, we'll make sure everybody's got what they need. Um, obviously, there's things that the students will need to have with them occasionally. So things like inhalers. I don't want to be taking somebody's inhaler and putting it in, in a bag and then somebody you know, suffering with a little, little bit of asthma and then not being able to access it. Again, you know, people will have an EpiPen if they've got that anaphylaxis. Uh, but there will be other things that you know, we want to take off the students to look after. Um, all we ask is that you put those in a uh, bag with the student's name. Any information that will help us out to help us to administer medicines um, that we can then use to then give the, the students the medicines they need. If anybody's got any kind of concerns about any medicine or any, any kind of medical requirements, it's absolutely fine to send me an email and say, please Mr. Boomer, could we just talk through this and I'll phone you and we'll obviously put things in place. Um, so other things to sort out before we actually get there, some money, that's something that people talk about. Um, we kind of like run a bank system on the trip. 76 students will be kind of like spread around all of the different staff members on the trip. Um, we'll all be looking after eight or nine students each. Um, so we run like a bank system just to take that kind of like onus off the students having to look after money, keeping money in kind of like rooms. We'll just like walk all money away. So what we do is we kind of like ask you to put any of their, their money in an envelope and then we'll just collect that in on the bus on the way there. And we'll just run a banking system. It's, it's not kind of like what you're spending the money on. It's a, I'm just looking after your money. You come and see Mr. Bank Manager. If you want some money, we can give you money. But we might advise you that you've spent 40 euros already and you've still not even left the country. <laughs> Just remember that you've got another six days to go and you've only got 10 euros left. So, um, so whilst all food is included on in the trip, um, except for the journey there and the journey back, um, the only things that, that they really can spend euros on is kind of like drinks in the mountains or extra food if they wanted to spend extra money on, on the food in the mountains. I mean, 10 euros goes quite a long way in the mountain restaurant. I think you could buy like a burger and chips for about 10 euros. But if you wanted to have a drink with it, that might come to another 3 euros. So you multiply that by sort of like five days in, that's 15 euros, isn't it? And then if they wanted to buy like an apple strudel or I don't know, pancakes out in Austria, brilliant, so maybe 4 euros and then, you know, you know it starts to add up, but you know we should be bringing loads and loads and loads of euros. Even our evening ends activities are paid for. Um, I put at the bottom prepaid credit card. That was something I did uh, on on a trip recently. I didn't get my euros sorted out, and I was like, oh, well, I'll just play with my own bank card. And then I just looked at the commission that my own bank card got, and I went, 
I've only spent two pounds and they've charged me 35 pence to make that transaction. And then I found this credit card called TravelX. And all you do is you upload <coughs> money onto the TravelX card and then it converts the money that you put in the card into euros and you just pay for things and it doesn't actually add any commission. It's brilliant. I would even as parents give you some advice, get a TravelX card, they're brilliant and it's just there's no commission added on. You could get one of them sorted out for your child. You don't have to send them with cash. And they, they're accepted in all of the mountain restaurants and they can just ping. And then you can see what they're spending the money on too as well. Because, um, English currency, just for when we're traveling there, um, for any service stops and on the way back. We also, we're going to take the tuck with us. So I'll, I'll pop to the cash and carry and I'll buy lots and lots of chocolates and sweets and crisps and drinks and things. Because there isn't that opportunity for the students to just pop to the shop to buy those things. Um, and what we do is we just run it as a kind of like a tally system. You buy three, three drinks, three chocolate bars, three crisps, that comes to, whatever it comes to. And we just take, take one amount of the students at the end of the trip. So they just need some money for tuck. Um, we kind of have like tuck monitors as well. The tuck doesn't replace the food that's in resorts. It's just it's just a supplement there. Okay. Right. Uh, how are we getting there then? So we are going with Atkinson coaches. I've had a lovely conversation with Mr. Atkinson, the coach driver, this uh, this morning to really try and persuade him to pick us up from Millthorpe School on the morning of the the 9th of April. I don't really want to have to use Naves My Road with 76 of you dropping your children off on, I think it's Easter Saturday. It's definitely Saturday and it's, it's of the Easter holidays. I'm expecting the Naves My Road to be very, very busy. So please, Mr. Atkinson, can you come to North Park School? Well, he's got two brand new coaches and he's reluctant to turn around at the bottom of Philadelphia Terrace. Um, He's, he's sending one of his drivers out for a recce tomorrow. He said, I could come tomorrow, but I can't come for your parents even. I said, well, okay. So he's going to have a look. So if it stands like this, um, we will be setting off from Millthorpe School. And so I put down, um, drop off between 10 past 12 and half and 20 to 1. It's a half an hour window. What we want you to do is to arrive, drop off, go away. Um, we then will take the students' luggage, put it onto the bus. They'll be stressing about which bus it's gone. It doesn't matter because we've got two coaches. They're all going to the same place. But we'll arrive in here. Once we arrived in here, we can look at things like medication and things like that, and then have a final toilet stop before we need to before we get on the coaches. Um, if it changes, I'll just have to email you what the changes. Now. I know many of you wanted to know what time we set up. We still haven't finalised the, the ferry crossing, so we still don't know what boat we're going on, but we are going from Dover on p &O ferries around about 10 o'clock, which gets us into Calais about 20 to 1 in the morning. And then we've got a very long journey across France and Austria to get to Austria, um, to the hotel guest house. Vern, Vernhoff, Vernon and Hoff. And then on the way back, we are leaving at Friday, sorry, that should say Friday the 15th of April. That's a typo, I'm really sorry about that. Because that says 2020, doesn't it? And it's 2022. I didn't cut and paste off my previous presentation, honestly. Um, um, so that should say 15th of April 2022. I will email you the correct version. I've just got a paper copy. Um, and then we get back on Saturday the 16th of April, my birthday. Um, somewhere around. Um, just reading that. 6 pm. Now, it could be a lot earlier. We've been back in York for like 2 pm. The window, I just don't know. But what we will do is we will allow students to be phoning, contacting parents on the journey to be able to inform you of what the kind of the estimated arrival time back is. Um, right, in terms of the journey, so the coaches are home for two days and um, it's, it's, it's not 
It's not too bad on the way there because there's that excitement of going abroad on a, on a trip with your friends. And, uh, but, you know, it's not the most pleasant of experience, particularly for any member of staff who's been on a, a coach trip to, to Europe in the past. I think I've done maybe about 13 or 14 trips, and I'm not looking forward to this one. Uh, but it is what it is. Um, we've, we've got rules, and we have to follow them, so things like seat belts, armrests, getting on and off the coach, you know, treating the coaches with dignity and respect, you know, chewing gum, uh, you'd be allocated to coaches and things, just have a read of that information at your own leisure. Um, those are kind of like, obviously, general rules, but these are the, the expectations. So, just about being prompt, courteous to others, not playing music from mini speakers. Um, now, we don't want anybody to be poorly. Fortunately, the invention of the screen for children to look at whilst they're in transit was obviously not great for travel sickness. Um, we will never ever be angry or annoyed at anybody that starts to feel travel sick, but we will just will be not that impressed if they, they remain silent and then choose to, to be ill all over the coach without actually making us aware of the fact that we were feeling poorly. Um, because we don't want to be spending time when somebody's been poorly in a coach for another 20 hours with the smell of somebody that's just been poorly. Um, so what we do is we encourage any of your children who, who have suffered from travel sickness in the past to, to, to take travel sickness pills. My daughter's terrible. We've got these little bands that she wears on her wrists. There's a little pressure point that goes on the wrist that helps with the travel sickness. We encourage you to keep looking out the window, sip water, not drink lots of fizzy drinks, not lots of chocolate, and do not look at a screen in transit. Um, the coach has toilet, there would be toilet on there, but we kind of like use it as an emergency toilet. Um, because we do stop regularly. So it's like getting off, we're going to use the facilities in their in the services so that we don't have to keep on using the loo because every time somebody loses, uses the loo, they're getting out of the seat, they're walking down the coach. Whilst it's in transit, it's not the safest thing to be doing. So, the toilet is emergency only. Um, I put comfort on the coach. So, again, I'm not going to read through that. Um, it just talks about what we should bring. DVDs, do they know what DVDs are, your children? <laughs> you have to go in the loft and dig out some of your old DVDs. I've got some in my loft, I'll have to dig some of mine out. But the coaches will have a platform to play film and they'll have screens and we'll be able to enjoy a film together. I mean, when was the last time you did that with your children? Enjoyed some television together with the children. Um, and that would be nice, wouldn't it, that we can put something on to watch. So if you have got a favourite film that you want to bring along and you've got it on DVD, which you might not, um, just have your name on it so that when you hand it to me, we may negotiate and play that on the journey on the way back. Uh, travel on the ferry. So once we get down to, to Dover, um, it's the most stressful part of the journey for, for us as your staff because we just don't know what's going to happen as we, we arrive on the boat because it's, it's very much, right, coach is on, get off you can't stay down at the bottom and then you don't know what deck you're on so you might be on deck two or deck three you might have to go up two flights of stairs or three flights of stairs to get to a lounge but because it's disorientating um, you don't know whether you should go to the front of the boat or the back of the boat um, because you haven't been on that boat before and you've got 76 children in tow but you've not also got 76 children in tow you've got another 30, 35 coaches from other schools, all wearing the same colour hoodie that you've decided to put with the children in. Um, and we've got to find somewhere to find a space to, to have as a kind of like a designated meeting area. It's very stressful. So I kind of like to put these things down. So you just have to follow the lead of you, the lead of the teacher that you're allocated to. So I'll be saying, right, Mr. Sloan, can you please take your group of students off? Mr. Sloan will lead the way, and then his students will follow like sheep. Um, and hopefully Mr. Sloan is, is savvy, he's really quick, and he finds that brilliant spot in the corner, which yes, there's definitely enough space for all of us to sit here. 
hopefully we don't get there and the other coach groups got there or whatever before us and we have to probably just we're gonna go back and find somewhere else. Once we've got that place, then the students can then go off on, on the ferry in the groups of three or more. Rule of three, and just for obvious reasons, and there'll just be a designated time to come back. Um, at no point can students access the outside of the boat. It's just forbidden. They're not allowed to go out. They can't ask the question, can we have a look outside, sir? No. We stayed inside the coach. We are also not allowed to go down, back down to the coach area. They just have to remain on deck. And they can go to the canteen, they can go into the duty free. There might be a gambling area, of course, they can't go in there because they're not old enough. There's probably somebody there saying that they can't go there. Um, but they can wander around in their groups of three. And then at a certain time, they will come back to that designated meeting area and we will go through the same old ring roll to get them down onto the coaches. Um, and it's quite stressful. I don't know if any of you have happened to travel the February half term or Easter when there's millions of coaches on the same ferry. It's, uh, yeah. It's not something I'm looking forward to, but we will manage it because that's what we're going to do. We're going to look after children. Uh, right, this is where we're staying. Uh, guest house, Bern, Bern, Roth, Bern, Bern, Austria. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hotel that's slightly out of an urban area. It's kind of like set in a rural setting. Um, it's very nice. Um, I had a visit to it. It's, uh, it's, it's lovely food, I know that, the food was outstanding and the service was excellent. Um, the hotel is familiar with school groups, they are accommodating, they can't do enough for you. you know, that comes down to the service that they provide for you and also the food that they serve us when we're there. I had the most amazing mixed grill, it was, oh, it was just lovely. Um, they do try and serve you things like river fish, I don't know if anybody ever tried river fish. Um, I don't think they'll be serving the children that. They will, they will be catering for the needs of children with particular taste buds. Um, and it's a, it's a hotel that has been used many, many times. Obviously high expectations of students and their behaviour. Um, there's going to be rules to follow. And I mean, I've listed them there. I want you to talk through those rules with your parents, sorry, with your children. It's just about all of the things that you would say to your children if you were taking them to a hotel and they were allowed to be able to move freely around it. Number one is, rule is that the rooms are their rooms, they're not going to any of anybody else's rooms, there will be communal areas, um, so that needs to be expressed. Um, uh, right, room sharing. As of yet, the hotel haven't come back to me and supplied me with the room allocation and I've been chasing this for, for weeks. Yeah. Why it's taken them so long to come back to me to tell me that, I mean, I know I've got 86 guests, so they know that they're accommodating 86 guests, why can't they just send me the room allocation? But they, are, they haven't sent it. So, the children in the room, and um, you've probably been thinking, I want to share with such and such, and I want to share with such and such, I don't want to share with them, or, you know, you've got your ideas in your head who you're going to share a room with. Until I get the room allocation, there's no point in getting into a meeting. It might be that I have, I don't know, 20 rooms with four people in it, but I might have 13 rooms with three people in it, so that doesn't help me. As soon as I get the room allocation, I'll be asking each kind of like section of the, of the trip, so we've got three year groups and three genders, so I might say, all of you year 10 girls, you're coming to a meeting on Tuesday lunchtime, uh, half past, I think when your lunch is, half past 12 in sports, so please be there and we'll sort your rooming out together. And then it might be the year eight boys, I'm doing you on Thursday after school at 10 past three in sports, so please come to that meeting. And I'll just place them in the rooms. Now there's going to be negotiation, but I will always endeavour to put them with their friends. I'm not, I'm not here to, to make the, the negative experience. They will, they'll want to be with their friends, absolutely fine. Yes, excellent, you can go with your friends if I can accommodate it. And if you've got a group of four that have got in mind and I haven't got two, a room for four, and I've got two twos, I might have to split them up and they'll have to decide where they go. But for the amount of time that they're spending in that room, it's a sleeping environment and oh yes, they will need to sleep when we get there. There will be internet and Wi-Fi in the hotel. Um, you're not going to have the same parental safety setups in the resort, in the hotel as you may have at home. Just need to make you aware of that. You 
want to put things in place yourselves. I don't know if you're able to do that with electronic devices. Um, and I don't know whether the Wi Fi is free or not. It'd probably be free Wi Fi in the hotel, but it might not have great connectivity. You might be able to access something that's paid. I don't know until, until we get there. Um, this is kind of like a big one. Because um, you're so easy to contact, and now with all the kind of data roaming through Europe and things, it doesn't cost somebody any money, more money to phone from England, from Austria, as it would do if you're phoning just from around the corner. So, so we would expect students to be staying in touch with you, of course, because they love you, and they're not going to, you know, they're going to be missing you terribly, and um, they need to obviously be speaking to you all the time. Um, but on previous trips, we've had situations where, where students have become anxious or worried or concerned or, or annoyed or angry or, you know, disillusioned with the whole ski trip experience and the first port of call has been the parent. Well, that doesn't help us on the trip because there's nothing, all you can do is reassure them on the phone. And if we don't know about these things, um, we are obviously <coughs> blind to the fact. And of course, yeah. Children will obviously go to use port call, but it's really important that you tell them to come and speak to us, because um, we are on site and we are there to, to help them to get through any worries or concerns if it's a friendship issue. Like in school, you know, people might fall out, something might have been said. We are there to, to manage the situation out. And if the port call is, is home all the time, we don't know about it, we can't help out. Um, people might get a bit homesick. Um, I'm sure that when the boys and girls are on the trip, they, they don't think that that's going to happen, but it, it happens. Um, again, we expect it, um, and we're hand to man on hand to manage it if we know about it. Um, we ask parents to encourage the students to, to come speak to us. And, and what you'll see is, is a different side to your teachers on the trip. You won't see the disciplinarian movement. You won't, well, you might do. Depending on how, uh, how your behaviour is, but but what I'm saying is that you do see a different side to your teachers, and they will probably find it slightly easier to try and have that kind of like difficult conversation with that member of staff because you're seeing them in a different light. Please don't sit in silence. Um, right, took short information about that. We'll open it at various points on the trip, maybe in the morning as we get back on an evening. It's not there to um, substitute food that's not been eaten. Um, please know that it's, it's not alternative to eating nutritional food. Um, we will monitor it um, for excessive uh, buying of sweets, chocolates and fizzy drinks. Um, mobile phones. So, yeah, again, to tear somebody away from a mobile phone, um, we, um, we expect students to be on the mobile phones. Um, but there's going to be times when they're not to go on the mobile phone, so we'll be kind of strict about that. One of the times is when we sat down eating meals. Um, if I or any member of staff need to talk to the group, phones are away. Um, at no point in ski lessons unless you've kind of negotiated with your ski teacher that you just happen to want to get your phone out to take a photograph of something. You want to take a photograph of a mom because you've never seen a mom before and there happens to be one running across there. Or your friend in the ski gear, or you want to take a small video of your pal just trying to do a little jump and face planting. That, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of time that you can take the phone out. Um, not just to check your social media and things. At no point is any, any student to be taking any photographs or unwanted photographs of staff or videos of staff without that member of staff knowing about it. Um, of course, for obvious reasons. Um, we hope the students engage with the peers, the trip and keep the screen time to minimum, but the technological world sometimes is more appealing than the real world, of course. Um, we will encourage students to be mindful of each other and we may encourage them to you know, put the phone down, just engage in some conversation, as you would do as parents, as I do with my two children. Six year old, three year old, and uh, yeah, they have far too much screen time than two. Um, okay. I, I was asked the question, where are we going? Well, it's hard to describe it because 
it's not one resort, it's a huge area. So we've got all of these kind of like connecting bands. Alpendorf is on the far right hand side. I forgot the point in there, I don't want to turn up, but it's the far right hand side. That's generally where we start off. And we take the lifts to the top of that peak, and that's a, a very big learning area. By the end of the week, groups will be skiing up there, down, taking the lift to the top, down to the next valley, take the next and down, across and down. You know, you, you can ski runs that you never ski, you can, you can spend the whole week in this resort and never ski the same run, it's massive. Um, when we were on our inspection visit, we tried to go from Alpendorf all the way across and back again, and we didn't manage to make it across in the full day. Uh, it's enormous. Um, but of course, when we went in, in February, um, there was lots of snow in Easter. We don't know what the snow conditions are gonna be like. They're not gonna be as good as, as February half term, but we don't need to worry too much because the snow making facility in the resort is excellent. The problem, the only thing that kind of happens is sometimes the end runs, the ones that go down to the villages, um, are often not very great, but very good condition. Sometimes they, you can't ski to the bottom, so you may have to kind of like get a gondola down, but there's, there's obviously skiing in the resort. Um, ski fit. So when we get to the hotel, first thing we do is we get ski fit sorted. The IBT staff on hand, they help us to put our ski boots and things on. Uh, that's done on the, the Sunday when we get to the hotel. Um, they're not the most comfortable. Many of the students have worn them, many of the students haven't worn them. But we, we try our ski boots on. We've got a number, we ask you to take a photograph of that so that that's on your phone because your ski boots are your ski boots. Just because there's another pair of size sevens next to yours, you've got to take them because all the skis are related to the, the ski boots are related to skis. We'll be there to help out. Um, then, once we've done that, um, we then take a photograph of our skis and everything will be at the hotel on the first day. That gets loaded onto the coach and then we obviously go and ski in the first morning after the first day. Um, we we might have our skis in resort, so we don't have to organise our skis in the morning, which is what we hope. Um, so, when we're getting ready for skiing, we need to ultra-organise, punctual, resilient and helpful with each other. Um, it's, uh, it's quite a stress to get ourselves ready to get out in the morning. Um, you need to be on the ball, students, and we as your staff will be helping you, but you need to be resilient and, and ultra-organised and helpful because when you're a small person and you're carrying some skis and some poles and you've got a bag and then you've got ski boots and you're having to walk on an icy surface or a gravelly area and you've got to walk up a slope like that and you're wearing a big coat and the sun's beating on your back, it's, it's quite hard. But we've got to just be resilient and get on with it. We are there to help you but we're not there to carry things for you. So having resilience. Typical ski day starts around half seven and finishes about quarter past four. Again, I'm not going to talk through that, you can read through that. Um, it's action packed, cooperation, resilience important. Um, being self sufficient is kind of like important. We'll encourage you to be self sufficient. Um, questions are asked about ski ability. So, IBT have received all the info you've sent. I know some parents have emailed me things that have happened. I know you might have taken the children to escape since, since you sent the information in. Um, I've updated that. That information goes to IBT. And they, they are the experts. That's why we use them. They've got all of this experience with school groups. Um, so they organise the ski groups. But they know that we've got three different year groups. And then we know we've got some beginners, some intermediate, and some advanced. So they will organise it based around those, those factors. We expect probably initially beginner groups will probably be defined by their year groups. But we can't always say that the intermediate stroke advance will be defined by year group because if we've got two year eight students who've had four weeks of skiing and we've got five year nines who've had and two year tens, so they will be an advanced group. And that's what we want, isn't it? We want them to be in the right ability groups. Of course, um, it's not fixed. So people will progress at different rates. So if we've got five beginner groups, 
after day two, they'll look at those five beginner groups and they might kind of cream off the, the ones who are flying from the top of those five to make one group. And then the ones in the middle kind of like make another two, three groups. And the ones who are really struggling, they might make a group. So that, that's the kind of thing that happened. And it is fluid. Again, your sons and daughters might be thinking, oh, well, I just want to go ask you a friend. We'll listen to them. And, you know, it's part of that. Yeah. Part of it, we will listen to them. We know that the friendship thing is an issue, and we know that it's important to them, and we're not there to spoil their enjoyment, and we'll, of course, take things into consideration. There's lots of expectations in, res um, in respect to the ski lessons, because we pass the ownership of <coughs> responsibility onto the to ski instructors. We are around and about. I mean, there's some Milford members of the staff who've never skied before, so. So that would be nice for the beginners to be learning with their, with their staff members. But there are some members of staff who, who have skied many, many times. We're not, we're not kind of always going to be with the ski groups all of the time. It's not going to be like 10 members of staff, 10 groups, one member of staff per group. The instruction, we are not ski instructors. We actually become part of the kind of like the responsibility of the ski instructor when we join a group. We are there to kind of like uh, accommodate and be around if we need to be for the kind of the other things that are attached to ski group, um, such as behaviour issues. So, um, so we're not necessarily going to be with them at that time. Um, number one thing is that don't do your own thing when you're in ski lessons. Just follow your instructor. Now, if you if you follow your instructor and you aim to try and improve your talents, then you're more likely to move into a more able group. A more able group is more likely to be able to access more challenging slopes, longer slopes, slopes that take you into different parts of the, of the valley. And if we can get away from the big areas, the, the, the kind of like the learning areas, of course, the learning area is quite a busy area. You move away from the learning area and then you get to experience what it's like to be skiing when it's not so busy. Um, Again, I'm not going to talk through these because I'm just aware of time. Um, accidents and illness. So, um, yeah, accidents do happen in ski resorts. Um, I've kind of put on the hope to run a trip where it's only minor incidents or minor accidents that require minimal first aid. Um, of course, as we would do in a school, as you would, you would uh, administer first aid. <coughs> if Students suffer an injury that means that they're unable to ski, ski but only requires simple first aid. Then, of course, they, if they need to come out of ski school, they must come out of ski school. Um, they would, if it was beginners, they might be able to sit inside and watch, or they may be able to stay in the, the restaurant close to the beginner area. But we'd be encouraging them to get back into ski lessons as quickly as we possibly can. Because the problem with anybody that's not in ski lessons is they need to be supervised. And the supervision comes from the Milthorp staff. And, and whilst we do like children, we, we don't want to be sat, when we could be skiing, sat supervising children that have had an accident, which we will do, of course. Serious accidents, though, again, there's potential. Touch wood, keep our fingers crossed every morning. But there may be that um, there's a serious accident that requires hospital support. Again, um, we will act as you would do. So we will do everything that we would need to do. So we would be going to hospital. Uh, we would be acting as that local apprentice. We would be contacting him because it can be very stressful for students if they end up in hospital. And like emotionally kind of like situations arise. And of course, we will deal with anything like that with, with a huge amount of empathy and care and well-being and we will look after your children. We will obviously keep you in the loop as to what's going on. Um, illness, it kind of like there is a potential for illness. And again, we're going to ask students how they're feeling. Are they just tired? Are they just exhausted? Have they just done too much? Have they, have they got dehydrated because they haven't drunk enough? So we will monitor them. Hopefully we don't need to see doctors, but if we've got temperatures and things, we will see doctors. And IBT and Resolve are there on hand to help us with all those things. Evenings, um, we've got our two excursions, so we're going swimming. If there's a problem with anybody going swimming on the 
the sheet that the collected tonight, which, which is the medical guide, not medical, the consent form, it says, can your children swim? Um, so if they can't swim, put it on there, and then we can obviously have a continuously plan. Um, it's a brilliant pool, it's got a, an outside section, it's thermally heated, uh, it's got a slide, so remember your swimming costumes. Uh, we're also going to Tempin Bowling and Pool Bar one evening, so we've got tables booked and lanes booked, and that's one of our evening excursions. Um, it is tiring as skiing, so the next slide just talks about the fact that it's, it's really important to get rest. You can't kind of like fill every evening with something for your children to do. It's just not feasible. We can't be like Monday we're going here, Tuesday, they just get exhausted. So there has to be some downtime. And that downtime is, is for them to just relax, get some energy back, just chill out. Um, and of course, that means that they're more likely to enjoy the skiing element of things. Um, we obviously have kind of like curfews when it comes to going to bed, bedtimes, getting to bed at a reasonable time. It really just talks that slide just about the, the need to have lots and lots of rest. I think we're nearly there. So, emergencies. So, I've provided you with a, a phone number. That's an emergency phone number. It's fine for you to send your children on the ski trip with this booklet. But you need to write that number down somewhere because so you need to contact me. It's there for emergency. For non-emergency, you just need to email me. And I'm able to check my emails on a, on a daily basis. If there's any worries or concerns, that would be your first port of call. Mr. Booman, such and such, is he's feeling a little bit isolated. There's a group of people and they're not including them. Could you have a word? That's the kind of thing that you can email me about. Anything that I really need to know about there and then. In the moment, that would be the number to call. Um, I may be in the mountains, I may be skiing, there might not be mobile phone signal, so you leave a, a message, send follow up with a text message when the phone pings, then I pick that up and then I'm obviously able to correspond, correspond with you, and then we can talk about the situation in hand. Um, this presentation I will email to you through the school comms and email so you'll have a copy of it all to go through in your own leisure as well if you want to to bore yourselves anymore. Um, there's some videos at the end to watch as well which I'm not going to show you because I'm just aware of time. Um, it's, it's tricky, always tricky, when you are organising 76 students and their parents to, to provide me with information about head size, shoe size, um, skiing experience, I need you to send this in, that in, this in, that in. And, and I, sometimes it's, it's a little bit overwhelming of me. I feel like I'm asking lots of you all the time and I'm only asking you to send things in because I need the information. Um, I've asked you to send in PDFs today. I've asked you to complete a medical consent form. I've asked you to bring in um, passports and e-hit cards. Um, and I'm sorry about that, having to ask, and it, it does make me a bit anxious about the amount of stuff I have to ask from you. But from my perspective, when it doesn't come in, then the chasing that goes on after the fact, I get the office ladies to, to resend things, and I might put a note bulletin. If things come in really swift, it just makes my job, and everybody who's organising this ski trip's job, so much easier. Um, and I know that I've asked you to do lots of things as a consequence of this evening and, and getting things back in very quickly is just really, really helpful. Um, and to anybody that does that, I really do appreciate that and really does help out. So, just to finish off then, so the, the passport thing, if you haven't downloaded the NHS app and you think you need to do that, you need to keep your passport I've got some passports at the front. If you've already handed in a passport in and you've got I mean, a passport, you will be able to come and collect that. If you don't need to download the NHS app, I will take your passports off, or we will take your passports off you. You just need to come to the front. In addition to that, we have got all of this ski clothing in this box. When the next batch comes through, I'll send an email through to you to say that that's ready to collect. Um, if anybody's got any burning questions that you could want to ask, everybody, that's fine. 
Yes. Yes, absolutely. All our travel insurance and COVID insurance covers all eventualities. So if somebody was to come down with COVID, for example, prior to the trip, and you weren't able to travel, the, the travel insurance would cover that and you would get your refund for that trip. It might be that you've just got a question and you just want to come up to the front and ask me or any of the, my staff members on, but just say a big thank you. Got anything to hand in passports? You can come and do that, but thank you very much. Thank you for coming.